Well, good afternoon, everyone. I actually, um, I like this site because it invites, I think, an opportunity for us to have a debate as opposed to larger situations where people feel intimidated to raise their hand or ask questions. I think this really does set us up nicely to have more of a conversation. So what I have here is a very kind of 30, 45 minute PowerPoint presentation uh, that's going to take you through several of the disciplines and kind of give you a few bearings on how we thought about this. But I also want you to know that I'm happy to email this presentation to anyone that would like it. If you want to give you a business card, as soon as I get back, I'll email it to you. If you don't have a business card, I will give you my business card, and you can write your email on the back of it, and I can, uh, I can send it out to you. So um, don't worry about that there's too much information up here and you can't keep up with it. Um, we, can, we can get it into the email for you um, over the next day or two. Okay. Um, how did this all start? Um, Started with him. This is Charlie Munger. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know Charlie. Charlie is vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. You obviously know Berkshire Hathaway, the more celebrated than Warren Buffett. Well, this is Charlie's right hand man, if you will. He's somewhat of an intellectual jewel, in my opinion. Um, probably more hidden behind the celebrated Warren Buffett. Uh, but Charlie's been vice chairman for close to 30, 40 years. He's 89 years old this year. He saw him a few weeks ago at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, just as honoring. But he, he, shortly after the Warren Buffett Way book, which came out, Miles Thompson is here, the publisher that gave a first time author a shot at doing the book of Warren Buffett Way, which then allowed us to go past code and go time and keep going. But Miles was here, and he'll remember when the book came out. Shortly after that, Charlie gave a lecture. And I, I, we included Charlie uh, in the Warren Buffett book because he was a tremendous investor, had a great deal of influence on Warren. But in 1994, right after we wrapped up the book, he gave a lecture. Uh, at the Batson School at the University of uh, Southern California. It was Professor Babcock's class. And many of the students came thinking they were going to get the you know, secret tips, the stock taking tips that maybe Warren was using. They all came in there with the expert, come on in, sit down, relax. Uh, glad to have you. Um, they thought they were going to get kind of your stock tips about maybe how to make money, uh, what, what to buy or sell in the stock market. But instead, Charlie threw them a little curve. And he said, well, we're not going to talk about the stock market at all. He says, we're going to talk about something much more important. And what he said was, we're going to talk about the art of achieving worldly wisdom. Well, this is mouthful, isn't it? We're going to spend an hour talking about how you achieve worldly wisdom. And in his mind, the art of achieving worldly wisdom was very much about connecting the major mental models in many different disciplines. Take the big models in each of these disciplines, connect them together in a lattice work of thinking. And then connect them back to the stock market and use that insight to do better in the stock market. Well, when I first read the lecture, I found it very intimidating. I mean, first of all, I was a political science major and about was 20 years removed. And I remember going through physics and biology and things like that. And the idea of having to go revisit it again was somewhat intimidating, much less trying to grab all the models from all the different disciplines. But I took Charlie up on the challenge and said, okay, Charlie. If you actually think this is how you can achieve worldly wisdom, and then the, the course of it would, would actually help you improve your investment returns, I'm up for the task. And so that was the essence of the book. The, the original book was called Lattice Work of New Investing. It came out in 2000. Um, uh, first thing you want to know about uh, publishing is, one, don't let the author pick the title. I picked the title. It was the wrong title. My publisher might as well tell you that the paperback version called Investing, The Last of the Art, was a much better time than it was and sold many more books. The second thing was uh, never bring out an investment book in a fair market. Very bad. <laughs> we didn't want to do that. We wrote it in 1999, so we wrote it in a good bull market, but we published it in 2000. But Miles was great enough. He came over to Columbia University Business Press and um, um, uh, acquired the rights to the book and we, and we wrote the second edition. We had, I think, 100 new copies, uh, 100 new uh, books to the reading list, and we added a chapter on that. So let me run you through here pretty quick, and as I said, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so I'd like to get my hard work over first, so I decided to delve into physics. And it actually is apropos, because everything about investing begins with Isaac Newton. 1665, year of the Black Plague, uh, London is under siege, he's at Cambridge studying, all the students leave, head back to the countryside, Isaac Newton returns to the family farm, and it was that summer you know, the summer that um, Animus Moralibus, where his genius sprang forth, the wonder year. 
And that summer he clicked off, you know, uh, the invention of fluxions, calculus, optic theory, the theory of colors, and then lastly, the universal laws of gravitation, right? Uh, but it was almost 20 years later before he writes Principia Mathematica. And Principles of Mathematica comes out and he gives you the three laws, the three universal laws of motion, and some of that second law of motion, the second uh, law of motion, where it says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And it sets up this wonderful idea of equilibrium. And, and, and so you'll obviously kind of latch on to equilibrium in modern portfolio theory and the of the mean and all these things that we now know, um, whether they're right or not, we can talk about that. But Isaac Newton basically um, um, initiated it, and you cannot overemphasize how important this is, because prior to Isaac Newton, if you wanted to understand the world, movement of planets, how things work in the world, you basically went to the priest, or you went to the bishop, or you went to the church, because you needed some divine interpretation to figure out how the world works until Isaac Newton comes. And Isaac Newton starts to give us laws to understand the world, and not surprisingly, because it's very seductive. Mathematical precision, the ability to predict. And so other disciplines latch on to physics. They figure that this is the way to help them explain. So the social sciences and the economics, as you can well imagine, also latch on to it as well. But as we go through life, we begin to understand uh, over hundreds and hundreds of years that physics does a reasonably good job of explaining markets and economies, but not all the time. It seems like it gets it right most of the time but not all the time. And this is a quote from Gilbert Keith Chesterton that I always like, but, but you know, encapsulated the dilemma or the challenges that we have. And it said, the real trouble with this world of ours is not that it's an unreasonable world or even that it's an unreasonable one. The common kind of trouble is that it's nearly reasonable, but not quite. Life is not an illogicality, yet it's a practical logicians. It looks just a little more mathematical and regular than it is. Its exactitude is obvious, but its exactitude <coughs> is hidden. It's wildness lies in the way. And slow that last line. It's wildness lies in the way. And that's markets, isn't it? It's just that physics seems to get it right, and we seem to be able to predict things on a regular basis most of the time, except when the wildness lies in the way, and then we get it all completely wrong, right? So if physics is not the answer, where do we go to next? And then obviously we begin to think about Darwin. This is 175 years later. Uh, he publishes The Origin of Species. And many uh, economists and others begin to latch on to a Darwinian view, most, most notably probably Joseph Schumpeter in the early 20th century, his thesis of creative destruction. As a matter of fact, he went to see um, um, Alfred Marshall, who was then the ranking authority on economics, and, and he saw Alfred Marshall in the early 1900s, and said to him, I think this whole physics-based mechanical view of the world is wrong, and I think we need to dart into the biological Marshall weighed them all. The great, great biography of Joseph Schumpeter called The Prophet of Innovation by Thomas McGraw. If you ever want to go through that. So it's, it's wonderful how Schumpeter said, you know, we got it all wrong, we have to change it. And Marshall weighs him off and says, no, you're wrong, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get involved with this. And then lo and behold, in the eighth edition of Principles of Economics in the 1920s, so this would be about 12 years after Joseph Schumpeter came to see him. In the preface of the book, I came across this. It says, the mecca of economists lies in economic biology rather than economic dynamics. I almost fell out of the chair. And this is almost 100 years ago, right? He says, but biological conceptions are more complex than those of mechanics. We must therefore give a relatively large place to mechanical analogies. And that's what we've done. Basically, we don't have the Newton of the grass fields. We don't have the math of biology. We have the math of physics. And physics gives us from point A to point B with some level of predictability. So the mechanical analogies we have the math for, and so we use them. We don't have the math for the biology, so it's hard for us to predict how to get A plus B equals C. Without that math, you kind of lose it, and that makes us uncomfortable. So today, is what you'll see is that basically, we're still in an evolving process of how, about how to think about markets. And so if you think about physics, it's evolved over time from classic mechanics that you go from Newton into Einstein, Philip Italy, and quantum mechanics. So in fact, is classical economics. From classical economics, you get to Keynes, Minsky's negative feedback loops. And then finally, the, the most ranking science right now of biological interpretation of markets is uh, what's called complex adaptive systems. An economy is an involving complex system. I'm not sure you can see this, but this is from the Santa Fe Institute. We've been members of the Santa Fe Institute for a number of years, 20 plus years. And they guys up here, you might recognize Philip Anderson and Ken Harrell actually have Nobel Prizes in economics. 
and they came together with the idea that the mechanical view just doesn't work. And we need to begin to think about things differently. And so the Santa Fe Institute is a multidiscipline uh, research institute that studies complex adaptive systems. And complex adaptive systems are things like ant colonies, uh, your immune system, your neurological systems, river systems, and it also happens to be markets and economies. And they all have a lot of commonalities, and uh, they have a great deal of commonalities, I should say. So what do we know? We know that markets are inherently complex. So a simple system, a, a simple system would be like a light switch. You can turn it on and off at a high degree of difficulty. A complex system is a system that has millions and millions of parts. It could be, you know, the electrical system from the new living power. It could be a nuclear reactor. It could be, you know, you can think of millions and millions of parts. But even a commercial aircraft has millions and millions of parts. But you have some high degree of predictability how that complex system is going to operate. A complex adaptive system is different than the simple system and the complex system because this. The system learns and adapts. These millions of operating parts and commercial aircraft and uh, nuclear reactors and large buildings and things like that don't learn and attack. They behave the same way each and every time you turn it on and off the switch. But ant colonies and your immune system and economies and stock markets basically learn and adapt. When they learn and adapt, they change. And when they change, they're no longer highly predictable. Their behavior going forward is, is sometimes, not always, is sometimes different than their behavior in the past. And so you end up with these non-equilibrium systems, which is in a non-equilibrium system, small effects can have large consequences. And large consequences can sometimes have no consequence whatsoever. And here, one of my biggest pet peeves is that there's no such thing as a stable mean in biological and boy, we're mean reverting happy people in the market, aren't we? We believe that everything is predictable by mean reversion. That's the physics-based, you know, roadmap for us. You know, every action, action for every action is mean loss. Every action mean revert. However you want to get to it. The whole idea that things mean revert. They mean revert sometimes, but not always. And it's like that is what gets us into a great deal of trouble. If you really want to read a great book on complex adaptive systems, very fine conscious book, The Art of the Well, although we tagged uh, the art of the species, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book to kind of guide you through all this. Okay, so we need a new paradigm of shift in economic thinking. We're getting it right now. This is the famous book from Thomas Kuhn talking about the theories of scientific revolutions. We've got two paradigms in collision right now. The basic physics-based model, capital asset pricing model, um, Markowitz, Eugene Fama, Sharp, all these guys who've had decades and decades of basically preaching it as an Newtonian model. And now you've got a new group coming out, the Santa Fe, others like Andy Lowe at MIT, who have been doing some really great work on the evolutionary hypothesis of capital markets, trying to bridge it. And we will probably take decades to finish this argument. It doesn't wrap up <coughs> with people going, you're right, I was wrong. Nothing like that happens as friends. The paradigms are in collision. And over time, the only way that you get through a synthesis, a new idea, is that the old art actually has to die off. <laughs> Basically, the guys that have PhDs and books and all these uh, articles basically refuse to fall on the knife. And so they keep, keep making the argument. But what happens is the new paradigm uh, basically begins populating with the Andy Lowe's and other young people who then will then raise up the new viewpoint. And over time, their numbers will vastly outpace the, the numbers of the old ones. So we're right in the middle of that. Um, Lee and James, great. Quote from Will to Believe, you perceive the world differently, we must be willing to change the belief system, let the past slip away, expand our sense of now and dissolve the fear in our minds, new facts first old rules, then newly divine conceptions bind old and new together into a reconciling law. Okay, who is this guy? 
we do not realize that it moves not in a straight line and that its direction changes constantly. Okay. So this is the world. Remember, it's nonlinear. So the red line is markets and economies. Sometimes they go slow, sometimes they accelerate, they roll down, they change, right? Uh, it is a living system that evolves and changes over time. The orange lines, though, are our linear extrapolations of what has just happened. We think linear, but the world is nonlinear. You basically go, what has just happened, what has happened now, and you draw a line off those two points and continue to believe that the future will look like the past. And so, in the early 1990s, it may be easier to think about it, in the early 1990s, the economy is doing well in the early 90s, and so you believe that the world will continue to be that way. <coughs> but it begins to pick up speed. Actually, it's growing a little bit faster. And you go, well, I need to ratchet up how I think about it. And so each time that the real world is higher than your expectations, there's pocket opportunity booms. So you get into the late 1990s, the technology of the revolution, you go, man, I just think this thing keeps on going, keep on going, and so then it's going in a straight line up. And your expectations are that in 1999, the world is just going to be beautiful and brilliant, all of it as it has been for the last five years. And then it begins to fall over. Your expectations are higher in reality. And then you get the bus, and, the, and the money is lost. So we think linear, but the world is not linear. And you always have to reset your expectations. People who can reset their expectations quicker than others, or have the proper expectations go forward, be better in markets. And that's a thinking game, basically. That's a thinking challenge. To be able to take a linear extrapolation of how you see the world, and then judge whether that is accurate or not going forward, based upon the data that you let me give you another one. This is actually from Philosophical Investigations. Ludwig Wittgenstein had two periods in his life. 1913 14, Tractus came out. He might have had it perfectly down. And then about 1930, he basically turned it upside down and said, I didn't think I did philosophy very well, but I think it's totally different than um, uh, how I had perceived it in the past. And he began to think about uh, linguistic problems, that all problems in philosophy could be solved by the linguistic challenges that we have. So this book was never published. This is actually an album of his notes that his colleagues and associates put together after his death. But in his um, notes, he writes this down. He says, for a large class of cases, though not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, we define thus. The meaning of a word is its use in a language. Let me say that again. The meaning of a word is its use in a language. And so what you begin to think about, you're taking words. You have chosen a word. That word now has meaning. That meaning now forms a description. That description ultimately gives you the explanation. And in his mind, that was what all philosophy problems, philosophical problems had to do with, was this ability to see things differently. And people see things differently by the words in which they choose. So let me give you a real life example. Right in the middle of his notes, he draws, he draws this very simple triangle. And he says, take as an example the aspects of a triangle. This triangle can be seen as a triangular pole, looking down a rabbit hole. It can be seen as a solid, a geometrical drawing. It's standing on its face, it's hanging from its apex. It's a mountain, it's a wedge, it's an arrow, it's a pointer. It's an overturned object, which is meant to stand on the shorter side of a right angle. as a half parallelogram in various other things. A lot of ways in which to describe the triangle. And whichever word you choose, there's lots of words to choose. Whichever word you choose will now give meaning to that object. Right? That meaning then will ultimately form the description. And if your description is wrong, it is because the meaning is wrong. And if the meaning is wrong, it's because you chose the wrong word. So let me give you an example in investing. Years ago, um, we bought uh, Amazon.com. We actually bought it in 1999 and 2000, right through the crash. We ended up buying it all the way down through the crash, and our average price at the bottom was about nine dollars a share. And we were pretty bullish on the stock. We spent a lot of time with Jeff Bezos and understood how the business model worked and how people were not thinking about it correctly. But the bare case on Amazon in the early period was Amazon is Barnes and Noble. Right? Amazon basically Jeff got a bunch of books put them in the garage, took orders over the internet, and sent the books out to the you know, UPS and the postal system. So he sold books, and everybody said, Amazon is just like Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble sells books. And I said, okay, I understand that. Uh, so you believe that your description of Amazon is Barnes & Noble, and then they took the economics of Barnes & Noble, it's price earnings multiple, price per book, dividend yield, whatever the case may be, and said, look, this is the value of Barnes & Noble. How outrageous as it is that Amazon would be priced the way it is. And several years later, they began to sell games, and um, music, and then clothes, and electronics, and you name it. And they said, well, it's not Barnes & Noble, really, it's Walmart. 
and how you guys are even thinking about this as a value stock. And we said, well, in our opinion, it's not Barnes & Noble, it's not Walmart, it's Dell Computer. And boy, we could get pulled back on that. Dell Computer, before all this stuff that's going on now with Silver Lake and Southeastern Asset, we call Icon, basically was the best performing stock in the 1990s. That stock was up 10,000% in the decade of the 1990s. It's a phenomenal period. Uh, it was the very first company ever to get a triple-digit return on investment capital. No company had ever done that before. And what the Dell Computer, so they said to us, oh, you're just latching on to a proven winner. You want to latch on and tell me that you think Amazon is Dell because Dell went up 10,000%, 10, 10, so you're going to make me think that Amazon goes up 10,000%. I said, okay, what is Dell Computer? Well, Dell Computer is a direct distributor of personal computer products. You call up on the phone, most of you use the internet, you order your personal computer, you give them your American Express card, they have your internet locked in and there. Never mind that they don't have to pay the vendor for another 90 days. They have your cash now. And then they assemble the computer and they shove it out the distribution door and it heads to your mailbox. What is Amazon? We said Amazon is a direct distributor of retail products. You get on the internet or on the phone, you call Amazon and said, I want XYZ. You give them a credit card, they have your money now. Never mind, they don't have to pay the vendor for 90 days, in some cases 180 days. That's called negative working capital. You can use the cash from your customers to expand your business before you actually have to pay your supply. And the reason why Dell Computer went up 10,000% was the very first company to do, as I said, about 100% return on investment capital. The last quarter that we looked at Amazon, they did 225% return on income capital. It's growing its business off the negative working capital that it has. It's expanded its business on your credit card and able to grow it in such a rate of return over time, and the stock now is 250, and I think it's bland, you know, game slam dunk power, you want to use the phrase, that Amazon will be the world's largest direct distributor of retail products in every major country. It is already number one in the seven major industrial countries around the world. Nobody could doesn't see it. There's no way you can get overpriced. price. There's no way you can get better service. So why would you go to something else? Now, the interesting thing is, is the description changing. There are a lot of people that think that Amazon is not the direct distributor is actually becoming a new technology company of which it is its own biggest customer being a direct distributor of retail products. It's actually the number two largest provider of cloud services. So it's basically even working again and so you begin to have to think about it differently. So that's how philosophy can actually make you money in the market. This is from Benoit Mombenbrot. We were in a uh, lecture series in the early 2000s and Benoit passed away. Um, Practical geometry is a study of how to measure coastlines and river systems and leaves and pine cones and cauliflowers, things that were thought not to be measurable, <laughs> then while Mount Ball was able to measure. Um, he passed away a number of years ago, but before doing so, he's very large than six, seven, three hundred fifty pounds, and we we're having a big argument about the efficiency of the market. And behind him was like a room like this, so Ben Ball's in the very back. And there's arguments going on. Schiller's there and Bill and Moby and a bunch of people having all these arguments. And Mount Ball yells out in a big baritone voice, failure to explain this cause by failure to describe. And right then and there, I basically understood every mistake that I made. Pretty much everything you get wrong, including your arguments with your spouse, can be fine this way. What you thought happened didn't happen because the way in which you described it was not the way it happened. What you thought, by the words that you chose, that gave it the description, all the people with the explanation, didn't work out that way. There was another word that should have been used that gave it a different meaning. Of being the correct explanation. So when you think about that little triangle, you think about just a simple company like Amazon, think about the many different ways in which we can explain the economy and industry, or even the company. And you begin to realize there are many different ways in which to describe, and your job as an analyst is to come up with that by description of the company. Very quickly, how are we doing? Okay. Um, we did a chapter on literature. We actually, um, uh, Chris Nelson is the president of St. John's College. How many of you know St. John's College? It's one in Annapolis. I did good. If I ever had to do it all over again, I'd do St. John's College. I really would. Uh, the only institution in the United States that has a four-year program, they have a campus in Santa Fe, that all you do for four years is read the great books. You start with the Greeks. You go and you read Principia Mathematics if you want to know physics. If you want to know biology, you read origin species, and you come all the way up through the present. Uh, and that's all they do for four years. They don't take tests. They just write papers and discuss books with their tutors. But one of the most popular books on campus, according to Chris Nelson, is this book by Mortimer Adler called How to Read a Book, a Classic Guide to Intelligent Reading. I thought that was kind of interesting.
Jenkins, all these people are going to the great book program there, having you read a book about how to read a book. I think you had that part figured out before you got to school, right? But it's actually about the strategies of how to read a book. And I really found this to be very valuable for me that I continue to use it today because in, before I read the Mortimer Adler book, every book that I purchased, I purchased it as if it was an object of art and beauty and I would turn it slowly and I would absorb each page and the whole thing would take hours and hours if not days for me to get through. And Mortimer Adler says, you don't need all along. It's backwards. You don't even know if that book deserves your time. You don't even know if it's worth you spending hours and days if not do so. You're just presuming that it does. So he gave you different strategies to get through it. Inspectional reading is basically, is this book worth my time, my money? Let's just say, is it worth my money to pick up? So you can go into a bookstore, you can look at the back, you can look at the bibliography, the notes, you can look at the table of contents, you may be able to rush through it pretty quick. You're just trying to get an idea, do I want to go further with this book? You can do it on the internet now with Google and Amazon, look inside the book, right? And so that's basically just trying to tell you, do I even want to cross the line with this book here and begin to spend some time with it? If you do, the next part is called systematic skimming, which is you fly through that book as fast as you possibly can. You don't understand the part you just keep going. And what you're trying to do is in a few short hours, get through that book to determine whether it is actually worth your time to do what is called analytical reading, which is the way I used to read in the old days, which is spend a lot of time with the book, go slowly through. So analytical reading, I basically uh, put on, and anything that I think is worth, I'm sorry, systematic skimming, I put on Kindle. <coughs> so I can, you know, 9 whatever, and I can just get through that book very quickly. And if I view that this is a book that really wants to go to my library, that needs to go to my library, then I buy the hard copy. And when I buy the hard copy, I go to analytical reading, and then I make it my own. In the old days, I would never buy it in my books. I thought that they were just too beautiful. I couldn't, couldn't damage them. Now I've got yellow highlighters all through it. I've got notes in the margin. I've got an arrow that goes over here. I've got to go something over here. See page 189 back over here. You really absorb that book. And that is the book uh, that's going to have the greatest impact in your life for any point in time that you're you know, doing that reading. And so you really want to absorb as much of it. But his whole point was, these books here, you might have to read 10 to 15 to 20 to figure out if even one of these deserve this instead of wasting all the time reading many books at this speed without knowing that they actually are worth it. I thought that was great, and it really helped me in my reading. You have to read so much that now I only will spend hours and days with a book that actually qualifies for that time. And I would say now, two out of 10, three out of 10, make that list. Easily five that I would have bought and read in the old days, I don't even buy anything. I mean, I just get through them as quickly as I can, but I'm not happy. Just keep moving on, you can do a lot more reading that. Synoptical reading is simply reading about a topic. Um, reading on Andy Lowe. Andy Lowe read 21 books about the financial crisis. So it's reading different books about a singular topic to try to get a whole holistic view about it. So that would be if you pick a topic, but you would find some different books about that singular topic. Cast the net far and wide. Uh, I think nonfiction and fiction has a place. I love detectives books. I wrote a book of miles a number of years ago called The Detective and the Investor where we went through the famous uh, detectives, the guy on the far left, Edgar Allan Poe, so he obviously gave us the first detective of Christopher Penn, and the three short stories there, the guy <coughs> there, obviously, so our author, Tommy Doyle, this is uh, Sherlock Holmes. And along the way, I didn't know, give a Keith Chesterton, which we've seen before, gave his father Brown. I didn't know Father Brown, he was a cleric detective, but when I went to see Otto Pensler up at the Mysterious Bookshop here in New York, he said there's only three great detectives, those that can solve mysteries by their mental activity. And he said there's at least three. So we read all the short stories, luckily there were short stories from all of these detectives, and kind of went through there. And it really is a pretty good roadmap. I, I mean, a roadmap to think about how being a good analyst, but it goes to Penn, you know, you want to be a skeptic, conduct a thorough investigation. Um, you know, that, that kind of seems kind of uh, ordinary, but back in those days, that was pretty big stuff. Bad analytics, Sherlock Holmes, begin the investigation with an objective and an emotional viewpoint. I don't know how many times I've got an analyst that starts on it. Stop, and either hates it or loves it immediately. How do you know? You're not even supposed to have an opinion yet. You haven't even started studying it. So you begin it on emotion, you begin it detached. Pay attention to the tiniest details. At the end line, we begin to look at footnotes. Those tiny details that we overlook. Remain open minded to contrary information, apply logic and reasoning. Then Father Brown would be the Luther Wittgenstein <coughs> type of detective, right? Become a student of psychology, seek alternative explanations. All of Father Brown's books were great. Uh, short stories were great. And 
And that at the end, uh, what you thought happened, and he wasn't, you know, he had to play by the rules and give you the facts, but you always had a different view of what happened and what he did. He would give a twist at the end because he would be described in such a way that he would give you a different explanation. So that was good. Real quickly on mathematics, board, we just love averages in our life, um, and particularly markets. Uh, Stephen J. Gould wrote a great book called Spread of Excellence from Plato to Darwin. And in there he has a quote, he says, our culture invokes a strong bias if we should neglect or ignore variation. We tend to focus instead on measures of simple tendency, and as a result, we make some terrible mistakes, often with considerable impact. This was actually a, a very personal for Stephen J. Gold. Many years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago, he was uh, diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer. And uh, the doctor said, I have some very bad news, you have this cancer, and he goes, well, what's the life expectancy? The median mortality is eight months. Set that we see today. The population set we see today are largely 
to go today. And then why would you then actually assume that it would revert back to some historical mean when the population set isn't even the same one? So moving forward, of course, uh, company pop, corporate profits at 10% of GDP. Why does that have to revert back to 6%? The bearers want you to think it would go back to 6% at the shortest stop. But why should it? Well, the first thing is that 50 years ago, corporate tax uh, rates in this country were over 50%. So corporate profit rates are lower today. Therefore, corporate profits should be higher as a percent of GDP. Lay on the fact that they're multinationals and they have higher profit margins. So always be very careful about this reversion of mean, using historical averages to make part of the argument. It only works in the physics-based world when that population set is exactly the same as it was Five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it has to be the same population set. If it's not, this is nonsensical thinking. You shouldn't make any of your time. I'll very quickly wrap up the last two slides. Are we okay on time? So far? Yeah? About five more minutes. How many of you read Danny Conference book, Thinking Past and Slow? Okay, don't shout out the answer. You recognize it? Yeah. Okay. This is from Shane Frederick at Yale University, who basically gave a test to many of uh, these students, Yale, Harvard, Cornell, Princeton, and others. And three easy questions, right? A ball, back the ball costs a dollar ten, the back costs one dollar more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? It takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take a hundred machines to make hundred widgets? And last thing, the leg is a patch of lily pads, every day the patch doubles in size, it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire leg, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of it? So I've got nothing but Princeton, Cornell, Harvard, Yale, 1600, SAT, you're the brightest in the room. 60% of you got it wrong. 60% of you got it wrong when you were even asked, is that your final answer? Okay? Most of them said the back of the ball cost $1.10. How much does the uh, ball cost? They say 10 cents. My answer is 5 cents. But they were quickly go to 10 cents because it seemed to be a quick, intuitive answer. How about five minutes to make five widgets on five machines? They would say 100 minutes. 100 minutes. How long does it take? Five minutes. In the lily pad, they always say 24 days. Four seven. Okay? Nothing really too hard if you want to spend some time here. But why did all of these 1,600 SATs get wrong? And the answer is there's two types of thinking that we go through each System one and system two. System one is intuitive. You make very quick decisions. And thank God we have it. You couldn't get through the day without it. I mean, your ability to navigate this world is largely based upon system one thinking. And system one thinking does extremely well in events that are repeatable and predictable, and I've done it before, I know how it's going to work out, and so therefore I go with intuition to get through it. System one thinking does not do well at all in nonlinear systems. Things that are not repeatable, things that are not predictable, things that change. Evolve. System one thinking is horrible. At it. You have to turn on system two. System two thinking is reflective. It operates in a controlled manner, slowly and with effort. It's harder. System one thinking is I can give the answer right now and I'll, I'm done. I can move on to my next task. System two is labelless. I've got to spend a little bit more time in it. It requires concentration or associated with subjective experiences that have rule based applications. I think the problem that we have in investing is that. Spend too much time up here and very little time down here. Okay? And it has nothing to do with IQ. Nothing to do with who's the smartest person in the room. So Warren Buffett says, I've got a 160 IQ with no system two thinking, and I've got a 130 IQ with a lot of system two thinking. I'll take the 130 IQ every single time. And we don't spend enough time doing it. So, last slide, I think, maybe here's the last slide. This guy, uh, Keith Sandwich, he's a professor in uh, Toronto wrote a book called What Intelligent Tests Miss, The Psychology of Rational Thought. So rationality is achieving more life goals using the best means possible. If you're irrational, what he calls disrationality, which is an interesting term, it's the inability to think and behave rationally despite having high intelligence. Okay, if you have high intelligence, you're smart, but you're not rational. We know many people that are smart and can't make money in stock market because they're not rational. What are the principal causes of disrationality? According to Stanovich, it's a processing problem and a content problem. So, in summation, if you don't have, first of all, if you're operating in system one all the time, good luck. Markets aren't going to be very friendly to you at all. You're going to have to spend more time in system two. 
And then most importantly, if you don't have a reservoir of knowledge, information, mental models, Charlie Munger, to draw on in your system to, it gets even harder. So none of this is beyond the capabilities of anybody in this room. It's just a different way in which to think about how you're going to think about markets, how you're going to think about the things that you read, and, and at the end of the day, how you're going to allocate your time. And it's all very doable. So lastly, we come to William James' Principles of Psychology, the faculty for perceiving analogies to the best indication of genius, people who can analogize to the wits, the poets, the inventors, the scientific men, and the practical geniuses. And I think that's what our clients are asking us to do. They expect us to be the practical geniuses. You're so smart, that's why I'm paying you. You're the person who studies this all the time. You're the person who does this 24-7. I have a job, I've got other things to do. You're supposed to be making these decisions for me. But you're only going to do it, I think, extremely well if, in fact, you begin to think in more consistent terms and turn off system one thing and turn on system two thing. And to the degree that you do that a little bit more, um, I think you can have significant better results in the market. I told Miles I would put that up, so <laughs> my shameless plug for the book. We'll stop there. I think we're about you know 45 minutes into it. So we 10, 15, and I know your time's valuable, so those that have to leave, it's fine. As I said, I know some took notes. I'm happy to give you the PowerPoint presentation. You give me your email, I'll send it to you. Uh, but if you want to, we can spend the next 10 minutes or so talking, or I'm going to stick around for another 15 minutes and happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. What did I get wrong? There's always a physics major or a biology major or somebody says, but you got this. No, you didn't get that part right. No. Uh, you didn't really talk so much about behavior or crowds. Yes, we have a lot of it, yeah. You know, kind of like, in the market behaves in certain ways, or people behave in certain ways. Yeah. There's a lot in the book, and I apologize, we wouldn't have gotten through the end. I, I lean very heavily on Jim Dorothy's book, Wisdom of Crowds. And you can go back, we go back to this stuff uh, to find in the crowd. And basically, where you get these booms and buzz is you lose diversity of thought. You get the crowd behavior thing all one way. Her, her, her mentality. Her mentality has but one viewpoint of the world. Either it's going to be tremendously great or it's tremendously awful. But what Jensen Wiggy pointed out in Wisdom of Crowds is the degree that you get a diversity of thought. And that even ranks in intelligence and attitude. The degree that there's diversity of thought, you end up with more stable markets. And so it has to do with diversification of the inputs. There's been a lot written on this. I think you know, I would start with Jensen Wiggy's book. Um, Francis Galton, remember the guy that uh, had the box at the fair, right? And he, basically, he said for five shillings, I mean, how much this box weighs, right? And so so there would be some farmers who go, you get that thing right, and there would be a baker or somebody from the city and stuff like that. And you go, well, you don't have a clue, right? And basically what he then did, took the jar out, took the average of all of the opinions, and it was spot on. Even though the farmer would be off the variation of that too. And as he kept repeating the thing over and over again, he basically realized that if there's diversity of inputs, then that average of that diversity ends up being more white than any one expert or you know, ignorant. And there's a guy named Norman Johnson at Los Alamos National Laboratory that I met, spent time with, and he's done this on computers where he'll put computers together that have only the smartest agents in it, and they can't solve the problem faster than a diverse group of agents. Some average and like below average and like. So it's, it's a weird thing, but that, that's how that works. So when you get the, what they call diversity breakdowns, when you get a diversity breakdown, markets become unstable. Yeah. 
calls the university and says, what are you teaching these kids? They're very, you know, very narrow-minded. You know, they can only see the world in one point of view. And so now the corporations are pushing back on these schools saying, you're sending me stuff that works for a few years, but as I need them to grow and mature as managers, they're very limited in how they think. So there's an old saying that the liberal arts education is for the middle ages, because it's not until you're middle aged that you begin to understand how valuable it is. And that's absolutely true. So the Aspen Institute we're working with is trying to think about how to import this type of thinking into an undergraduate business education. So I've been working with Villanova, we've been doing some work at Fordham, um, other schools Columbia about trying to, you know, how, how can you import this stuff into an undergraduate business education? And you would think it is as simple as can be, but it's an agency problem that blows your mind. Because the philosophy teacher doesn't have any idea about markets and he doesn't want to be learning. The business professor who's been teaching half in, he's not going to talk about biology. I've just spent you know, 20 years of my PhD in, you know, doing cat in like this. I'm not going to change. So there's a lot of agency problems. So theoretically, everybody agrees with Charlie Munger. Everybody believes Charlie's got a spot on. Do you know you just spent $100 million on the dormitory at the University of Michigan? <laughs> Why did he spend $100 million on the dormitory at the University of Michigan? He was to promote um, for interaction. Exactly right. It was based on their 19 grad schools at the University of Michigan, and the graduate students at the University of Michigan that have to be the dorm must stay in this building, and they must be divided by me. And so the living space, the kitchen, the TV rooms, and everything will be living space that will force interactions of majors of different disciplines. So Charlie is putting his money in. So I didn't answer your question. And, 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 and Europe, we're going to be uh, Copenhagen Business School, um, St. Gallen and others that have really latched on to this presentation, they call it humanities. They don't call it liberal arts. They don't know what liberal arts is, they call it humanities. So we could have said invest in the last humanities, but that may not be that. Anything else? Did I miss something? Anything you disagree with? I'm always looking for improvement. Oh, yes. Just curious why you didn't include other fine arts like poetry, art, classical music, dance. I mean, you have certain gifts like philosophy, literature, but well, I already had a file on the third edition, and you're the second person. I had one guy at Berkshire came up to me and said music, and I said we got to talk about this because I think that's fascinating. I'd like to think more about that. I think art definitely, because art, art, art appreciation. In a detective book, there was a Yale Med School professor that made all his interns take art appreciation courses just to learn how to look. How to see things differently, how to redescribe the Wittgenstein approach. So I think there's a whole thing in the art appreciation world. Poetry I have to think about, but I'm open minded. So we're starting, you know, the third edition will be out, you know, in Moss that we can bring it out. But I think there'll be another chapter. I think I would love to do something in art and music uh, and, you know, add to it. Um, and so we'll, 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 I think we can see this expanding, and I'm always open minded. So if you have any ideas, and I'll give you one call, any ideas about how to, how to think about that, I would be most, most happy to have a conversation with you about that. So thank you very much for that. All right? Well, guys, you were very, very nice. I really appreciate your time. I'm happy to stick around for a little while. I know your time's valuable, but I really appreciate you coming out. Thanks a lot.